morning and welcome back to another episode of On the Trail with Felix and Tony. I am Felix Camacho. I'm running for governor in the upcoming 2022 general election. And joining me every week and every moment on the trail of the 2022 campaign is my running mate, Senator Tony Atta. Senator? Off a day. Off a day. Good morning. Well, we uh, we started this podcast at the beginning of our campaign leading up to the primary elections. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that we're past the primary, it's time to shift gears as we head into the general. And we here we are with about seven weeks to go. We want to invite everyone to join us and uh, remember that uh, all are invited, Republicans, Democrats, and Independents. We welcome all. Everyone. And we encourage everyone to exercise your right to vote on November 8th. Actually, early voting begins... October 10th. October yeah, 10th. October 10th. So, yeah, you know, to that. when they, when they uh, get to go down on early voting, don't forget that, uh, you know, Camacho Ada, Governor, Lieutenant Governor. And remember, it's, it's really critically important. Only 40% of those who registered came out to vote. The remaining 60% uh, is what we're, we are encouraging to get out there. And those that um, have not even registered to vote, please register. Um, again, there are registrars, registrars out there that uh, are seeking them, and mm -hmm. uh, we encourage you to participate. Don't sit this election out. Yeah. Make a difference. We are in the Valley of Decision, so make your vote count. And I think also um, equally important to know is that I think when they use the electronic voting devices that there is two pages there, right? I think that they have to continue to scroll down so that they don't only see one side of the ballot. They have to continue to scroll down on the, on the screen to see uh, the other side of the ballot, which is the Republican side of the ballot as well. I think there were other issues, I believe, uh, that came up with regard to those that went to vote. And if they had renewed their driver's license or got a new driver's license, the uh, the mistake was, I understand that um, their mailing address was identified as their voting precinct mm -hmm. instead of their actual uh, voting district. Voting district, mm -hmm. uh, the, the village upon which they live. Right. And so many voters were turned away and directed to another precinct. Perhaps many did not go and just uh, called it a day and went home without voting. So I hope they rectify and correct those problems uh, that are still there. Yeah, I, and you know, it's also important to know that they need to exercise their right and they should not be turned away. They should allow them to vote and it, mm -hmm. I believe, would be a provisional ba ballot that they would be voting on. So, you know, don't don't feel discouraged that if you go there and your name's not in the list that you still have that right to vote and they'll, they'll figure it out to the election commission. You sure hope so. Yeah, definitely. And so uh, today, I know that let let's begin with the um, clearing the record section. Uh, we got to clear this record definitely, and uh, clearing the record for for today is uh, Director Lacia Casil's comments on the Camacho Adits two K Memorial Run for nine eleven. Mm -hmm. You know, it's unfortunate, Governor, that we have a director of an agency that has so much time to concentrate on the Camacho Adda campaign mm -hmm. that the director cannot concentrate on the agency that they're appointed to uh, watch over. And I'm not sure if you heard anything coming out of the Hagatnya Restoration and Redevelopment Authority in the past several months, because I haven't. Well, I certainly haven't. I I do recall that they had a, a, a some kind of a pageant down uh, on the backside of the museum right. in Hagatnya. Yeah. Um, that's about all I I can yeah. recall hearing over the last four years. Yeah. So, you know, the the um, the, the agency's rec uh, main purpose is to get their master plan passed mm -hmm. and to implement the master plan. <laughs> and they haven't done the, the passing of the master plan, and they definitely haven't implemented. And I just don't see how the director has so much time and energy mm -hmm. to uh, go on the, the, uh, the radio— and then also the media, the, the print ad, and have so much to say about the Camacho Ada campaign. I mean, if that's the case, what the governor should do is, um, you know, save salary of $85,000 a year and have her be the spokesperson for the, the Young Guerrero Tenorio uh, campaign. And, you know, let's not, let's not waste taxpayers' dollars on, on, uh, on that agency to go out and just campaigning for the administration. That uh, you know, we we do have the the article, and yes. if we can ask the 
our producer, Mr. Boo, if you can just show the article of what was said by uh, mm-hmm. Director Casile. And she called our fundraiser insensitive. And actually, it, it wasn't a fundraiser. It was a get-together of individuals. Uh, the, the money that was raised took care of the, you know, paying the, um, the, uh, the expenses for it. The campaign made no dollars from this. And uh, it was a, a run that was well attended. We had so many people out there. We had... Uh, our firefighters that were out there as well and, you know, participated in, in this run. We had children. We had families. Yeah. We participated ourselves. And, um, yeah, it's disheartening to to see that when we come to remember and to honor those that uh, had lost their lives in 9-11, the impact upon the nation. Uh, many of our youth nowadays don't even know the significance of that event. But the mere fact that you're there to remember. You're there to honor, um, and and tell the story of, oh, yeah. for the next generation that uh, needs to know the history of, of what happened on 9/11. Yeah. Well over 20 years ago. I mean, we it's even important. had First Lady and Annette um, lighting the candle. candles for the 9/11. Yeah. Uh, we had a prayer, and then we started the the 2K, and mm-hmm. um, it was really great. Uh, got some photos showing up there, mm-hmm. and I believe we have a video of the. Um, the firefighters that were were walking, uh, when on that, uh, that photo there, where it was all of us with the two firefighters, uh, you know, we presented them some pins from the nine eleven memorial museum from New York City. Amen. So you know, nice. um, it, it was really uh, such a great event that uh, you know to memorialize and uh, remember those who lost their lives in, on nine eleven. Yeah, and, and the thing about it is, uh, it was it was so. Amazing to see them totally organic. Uh, they showed up. They did this on their own initiative. Mm-hmm. And um, we really respected them for, for doing that. So I just want to thank them for showing up. And, and they're, of course, their family members that carried the flag. Yeah. Representing the Guam Fire Department. So an yes, amazing uh, thing. Unfortunately, um, it is a political season. And some will take an opportunity to take a pot shot at something that was well intended. I mean, honor, you honorable. know, even Candid came out with uh, with an article on uh, Hagatnya Restoration and Redevelopment Authority about mm-hmm. what have they done in the past years that they've been, they've been, uh, and look at that, they, they, four years, a million dollars in one pageant. So I guess, you know, mm-hmm. Director Casil changing her, her, um, her, uh, uh, position from being a director to being a campaign spokesperson and you know then perhaps that's what they need to do is you know free up that 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 uh, department well you know the the thing that you have to remember is that um you know cumulatively the one million dollars that they've gotten in appropriated funds to operate this uh and and those are local funds that are appropriated out of the general fund does not include the federal and pandemic funds that were were also received, if any, right, and so uh, that's a lot of money. Yeah, and um, so again for eighty uh, eighty five thousand a year, yeah, uh, I guess they need to just make her become the spokesperson for the Lou and Josh uh, campaign and save us taxpayers eighty five thousand dollars. But with all, right. all that said, let's move on into the uh, into the next. Uh, yes, well, you know, uh, I think we let's talk about the. Um, on the trail this this week, there there are so many activities it almost becomes a blur, uh-huh. and you you move from one day to the next, and always filled with a lot of exciting events and being out there among the people. Uh, perhaps you can begin to share on on some of the events that we we were at uh, with, uh, for example, Dr. Tom Shea's um, 26th anniversary celebration down there at Ipau with at Bubba B. With Bubba B, you know, it was a uh, it was a celebration that was uh, you know Do- Dr. Shea has really gone above and beyond in celebrating his time here on Guam, uh, advancing women's health, right? And for him to always continuously uh, put celebrations out there, you know, recognizing his time here on Guam, it, it benefits everyone. And, you know, um, Dr. Shea is also in, in memory of his, uh, his mom, I believe, uh, the Sei Shu Ying uh, Scholarship Foundation, mm-hmm. right? They they have his his scholar athlete every year, um, and you know uh, 
everything that he does is always about promoting good health mm -hmm. and also promoting uh, women's health. So you know, you know, in talking with him, I asked him, you know, Doctor Shea, how did how did this all begin twenty six years ago? He said, you, you know, after after having gone through and being part of the U.S. Navy, going on to medical school, he was given certain options of where to serve, um, begin his his uh, medical practice uh, with the U.S. Navy, and of course, it began with, uh, I think, he had options for Coronado down in uh, perhaps San Diego. Uh, Hawaii was an option of where he comes from, of course, and, and Guam. But he was um, he was uh, sent to Guam, and he's been here now 26 years. I asked him, how many babies have you delivered? He says, over 10,000. Wow. A tremendous uh, contribution to our island, and he's very passionate, of course, about health care on this island. Yeah, my grandson's one of those babies he delivered. So Ryan is a, you know, a say, uh, Dr. Shea uh, baby, so. Yes, and all, also with our, our, our two children, Maria, um, grandchildren. Maria just had, uh, I think Misa was, was delivered by Dr. Shea. Yeah. Yeah, okay. our youngest and only granddaughter right now. <laughs> and then um, we had the 9-11 ro uh, Rotary Club of Northern Guam, the wreath laying ceremony up at Two Lovers Point, mm. a peace memorial. Um, that was, that was uh, very touching. And, uh, you know, when we get all the community, everyone in the community involved in what's going on. And, and that's what I guess what, it, you know, different functions throughout the island mm -hmm. that uh, was happening on 9-11 uh, just goes to show that, you know, we continue to memorialize those who have, who have lost their lives in, in the yeah. attacks in, on 9-11. Then we had our, our 2K also on, on that day on Sunday. And then uh, we had the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association 50th anniversary. You know, that was well attended it was as well. quite an event there. Yeah. We had, um, of course, our wives have been very active in the campaign, and both uh, uh, Joanna and Annette have visited the Senior Citizen Center, I believe, mm -hmm. in Talafofo. Right. And uh, joined them in playing bingo. Right. They've had a wonderful time there. Uh, visiting employees and, and different businesses throughout the week has been tremendous. And, and for me, I, I what I'm looking forward to, and it's not necessarily on the trail, but... Um, this week on the 23rd, my beloved mother will be turning 94 years old. Wow. Uh, our Nana will be, uh, otherwise, uh, you know, they call her Auntie Lou, Auntie Duty, but she is Lourdes Duenas Perez Camacho, 94 years strong. Wow. And uh, it, it, it certainly is a, Such a, a blessing. tremendous blessing. It is. You know, so we look forward to spending time with our, just our family uh -huh. and our, all of our of my siblings and the spouses and the our children and you know nieces and nephews and grandchildren and great grandchildren, <laughs> Bonana. So um, lo really looking forward to that. Enjoy the celebration. You know, and um, it it really it, it really talks about health and mm -hmm. how would I I often asked her mom how what's your secret to have lived such a, a long life, you know, and she says first of all, it's my faith in the Lord. The blessings, the grace and mercy of God, uh, living a faithful life, and and then you know she says you have to remember that I grew up in a generation where we lived off the land and off the sea. We we raised uh, my. She says my father had cattle, and once a month they would they would slaughter that and pati it, you know, with with uh, familia. Right, they'd keep what they need, but every other um, part of the cow that was that could be shared was shared among uh, relatives and friends. Um, they grew their the vegetables, they grew their fruits, they caught their fish. She talks about how they used to make their own salt, you know, the asiga. Yeah. And um, she says, so everybody talks about organic, but we lived organic, you know. <laughs> and then the war comes, she says, and, and, and with the war, everything changed. You know, with a, um, we lost all our... our all our livestock, and we lost our farm, and uh, everything was now preserved. There were canned meats and and other types of protein that we needed, uh, the rice that was imported, and, and and the like. And so, she says, "Yeah, your the, your generation now grew up with a different type of um, nutrition mm -hmm. and what what's served and and put on the table. Uh, a lot of it now being imported." And so, 
you know, I think we, we can talk about the topic of the day, which, day, which should be healthcare. Why don't we do that? Thank you, Nana. There we go. <laughs> With that life lesson. <laughs> it just takes way right into healthcare, one of our pillars. <laughs> one of our pillars yeah. on, on our... And that's, you know, and actually, when, when you think about it, that's investing in a healthy, healthy lifestyle, healthy mm-hmm. communities, right? And that's what we got to do with uh, with our generation today, is uh, continuing that trend of a healthy lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And you know, when when um, when we think about it, um, eating uh, eating the foods and uh, naturally that comes off the lands and the like what your mom did then, you know, with the cows and they share it. Hopefully that continues to be something that we we look forward to as well. Yes, you know, and and when we talk about healthcare, we're we're, we're talking about investing in healthy communities and, and lifestyles. We're talking about a self sustaining um, hospital. We're talking about modernizing healthcare facilities. We have to focus on our mental health services that are um, that are being offered, our public health services, and and the facilities that are there. Uh, the foundation, of course, for for public health and accessibility to healthcare coverage, mm-hmm. which is a, a big issue right now with um, a changing landscape and all that COVID has brought upon the, upon the cost of providing healthcare and the mandates of, of uh, 100% coverage of, of, of all these have driven the cost of healthcare up for, for all. Uh, we talked about the Guam Care Plan, we um, pre-approval of vendors, Offering healthcare, eliminating the year-to-year negotiations mm-hmm. that are um, very, very—it's it's very contentious. Not only that, but it, it is a long, drawn-out process, and we need to take a look at having longer-term types of contracts that would be negotiated, and uh, and the like. We uh, we have to talk about the the budgetary and benefit parameters within that. And then, of course, um, possible set aside of, of premiums to offset either increases to subscribers or, or losses to insurers. So it's it's a it's a huge topic, but uh, I do have to say that in, in talking with physicians that are out there serving our people, they the consensus is that the healthcare of our island and our people is in the worst shape it has ever been, and um, the GMHA condition, Guam Memorial Hospital condition is in shambles and it is a very dangerous situation not only for the patients that are going there but for the employees that are working there the physicians the nurses and all the other healthcare providers and everyone involved in that facility it is, it is a very dangerous situation that needs immediate attention and i uh, heard that the administration at one point was trying to get someone in to you know do some type of accreditation but at a a less uh um uh, what do they call it? Well, less than a joint credit, uh, yeah. joint commission accreditation, accreditation, right? You know, uh, which is the the highest level of uh, industry the premier standard. of uh, right. accreditations. And so, if you're going to get another agency to come in, that um, that would not o- offer such one as the joint uh, 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 commission accreditation, something of a lower level, just to say that yes, the hospital uh, is a safe environment. Then uh, I don't think that's a good path to take, and um, Certainly, things are out of control. Yeah, I mean, when the rains this past week has has proven to be um, more than just rains, and that the hospital has really suffered by the leakage all over the place of mm-hmm. you know the rain. It's like not having a roof at all, right? And you know yeah. the water just coming through. Um, I think We've that seen uh, it all. You know, not just not just the the hospital, but even the, the employees. You know, the the concern of uh, of their safety. You know what. When you see and you're walking through the hallways and you see a hospital blanket on the floor trying to soak up the water, you know, I mean, or where a does bucket, that, yeah, or where, a do, bucket. Where, where does that blanket go after that? You know, we we just had it on the floor, so it's gonna go and get clean and what? You know, does that become a damage item now, or is that gonna be on someone's bed mm-hmm. after it gets washed? I mean, so all these issues that are pressing with Guam Memorial Hospital, the leadership there has not addressed a lot of the things that are going on. And I think one of our candidates has, you know, this past week was trying to see what, what was going on in the uh, in the meeting at uh, the Hyatt. Mm-hmm. Seems like they had money to go out and, uh, and have a meeting somewhere else instead of the conference room. And, uh, you know, what, what, what became of that meeting? You know, what, what's the, 
what was the product of that meeting that they had that it was so important to have at a hotel and did the people of Guam benefit from it, but most importantly, did the hospital benefit from it? You know, um, really, it, it you just have to wonder, with all the money that uh, the government has received, I, I, I know during the debate, the governor was uh, professing that she is a nurse and uh, that she has compassion and that she cares. And at the start of her campaign during, during the um, previous election, she said that she would take care of, of, of situations. And, um, well, if, if she is a nurse, then why didn't she take care of GMH? Um, we got it accredited. She was critical, saying, well, it, it was lost during Eddie's administration. But with all the money in the world that, that we have well over $2 billion during this pandemic period, why, wasn't, uh, why weren't these issues addressed when you have the money? In fact, there's still um, roughly $300 million sitting in the bank right now. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, with plans to build a hospital, a billion-dollar facility up north um, in, in Manila, uh, at, at, down by Eagles Field, that is a dream. And we all know that that cannot be accomplished in the next four years or so. Um, the, the problem is now. The problem is immediate. And the, the situation has to be addressed. You can't put this off saying, well, we're going to just live with this. And, and uh, by the way, we promise you we're going to build a new hospital. That's, that's what's on the table. I don't, I don't think that is sufficient right now. Um, during this COVID period, I know that G, um, GRMC received their accreditation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing is it's not with the personnel and the management that maybe is from the Philippines as they are affiliated with, um, with Medical City out there, but rather... It was with our own local talent and with all, with the, our local management teams that have been able to get the highest and best of accreditation for GRMC, while our hospital has not. And and um, so there is a very dire situation when you think about the comparisons in in efficiency that are ongoing. Uh, GMHA has roughly thirteen hundred em employees um, for roughly a hundred beds. GRMC has roughly 700 employees with perhaps uh, I think 134, right? 134 beds. So when you think about it, it's uh, the ratio of um, full-time equivalent employees uh, per patient. The efficiencies are, are shown when you just do the average uh, roughly um, national, I believe it's about four. Mm -hmm. That would be the ratio of four employees per patient bed. But uh, it's well over 10 at think, GMH. Yeah, almost 14 14 or 16, somewhere in there. And mm -hmm. I think within uh, GRMC, it's roughly around five. So we're talking about efficiencies. And um, I understand recently they've, they've been spending about $5 million or so for recruitment of uh, healthcare personnel. Well, we just had that, you know, they had that included into the budget. Okay. With that $5 million going to GMH to recruit, uh, you know, special specialty doctors. Mm -hmm. Uh, the problem is, uh, you know, how are they going to afford to keep that specialty doctor on payroll after yeah. they recruit them? Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, we we haven't, at least I haven't received any of the documents that I requested from GMH, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, hosp the hospitalist compensation report. And that's the report that says how much the doctors and, you know, make at GMH and so that we can get a better idea and a better understanding of what what is being compensated to the doctors at, at GMH and, you know, how is it in, in um, you know, versus uh, GRMC. I mean, is the government of Guam, is the people of Guam getting the best, you know, mm -hmm. care and receiving the best care for the dollars that we're spending at GMH? Well, you know, I think that, that points to a real concern is that um, it seems that the approach would be if, if, if there is a problem, just pour money into it, mm -hmm. more and more money into it. Just turn on the spigot and pour more and more money into, into the situation, and uh, it'll, it'll get resolved. It, it, it kind of reminds me of the health of the economy, the health of the businesses as we go around um, and, and meet people in the different industries that are there. Some have benefited uh, during this chaotic situation of COVID-19. Others haven't. And uh, the general consensus out there is for the businesses that are involved in tourism, transportation, retail, and the like, 
um, they are just simply trying to survive. Right. And, um, and so the health of our economy, the health of our people, the, um, the concern that many have had with the shutdowns of the schools, the shutdowns of the churches, um, you know, the, the quarantining at home, the, the mandates for masks, the mandates for vac- vaccinations, the freedoms, the oppression, all that has happened, um, there is a there is a tremendous hurt right now in our community that um, is beginning to manifest, and mm-hmm. and even the drug drug epidemic that has been out that is out there and is very obvious in the crime and the violence, um, it's it's really sad. I I, I just want to point to um, one of the funerals that I had gone through and, and attended uh, for Petra, and uh, this was a homeless lady that had passed away. Um, on the bench over there by Micronesia Mall. Many had driven by, of course, and they would see a pile of clothes and an umbrella. And uh, I was asked, would you come and just share a few words at at um, her funeral? Because you, I know that you've been involved with, uh, and your, your group has been involved in feeding. And that's certainly one of the areas around Route 16 and Harmon Loop and leading up into Derido and by the church in the park area even across the mall uh, at that main intersection where you can see various campsites of people that are that are living there um, and also working the streets at every corner uh, asking for money and help. I had um, reached out to a couple of individuals that had actually provided a meal and assistance to Petra over the last close to two years. And one gentleman said, you know, I would go to the bus stop and Petra, of course, uh, was on the bench by the bus stop, uh, and I would, uh, I would, I, bu- I would present the food tray, and she would just very gratefully and thankfully, you know, receive it and say thank you. Um, not much communication. Another individual came and said, "Well, here's my testimony." She says, "Yes, she's passed away," and uh, as I had gone to the bus stop and presented the food, and also gone across the mall. They had told me that the night before Petra um, had passed away, she had um, gone across the street to the gas station or the service station and uh, began to cleanse herself, washing her hands, her arms, her face, her hair, preparing herself as if she knew something was coming. And it was the following morning that they found her, uh, passed away. But... um, you know, the, the woman had, had shared that, you know, not to worry, as she was explaining to everybody, that she had given her life to the Lord, that despite all of the challenges that she had in her life, that um, she's in a better place now. Mm-hmm. And um, the stories that were relayed by other family members were that, you know, Petra um, originated from the island of Yap, and uh, she had a dream of serving in the armed forces of the United States of America. I believe she was stationed up in Colorado Springs and served as a uh, postal clerk uh, primarily. Colorado Springs, so I'm assuming it may have been the Air Force. Mm. Uh, she had a couple of deployments into the Middle East. And uh, after 15 years of service as a veteran, she returned to her island uh, state of Yap and then eventually moved to Guam in uh, around 2006. And... Uh, but many people didn't know that she was a veteran, yeah. you know. And and again, it, you you have to wonder how did she end up in this state, and what can be done because the health of our community, not just the hospital, not just the public health center, like in Mangilo, that's been shut down, not just the the northern center that the you know the personnel up there is saying this place is a is a war zone. We need to we need to fix this thing up and. Uh, in my time, I know that we expanded it. We uh, expanded even the Southern Health Center. The the one up there in Mangilao has been um, burned out with an electrical fire. That certainly is a facility that can be refurbished and brought back to life to serve as our community. But the, the health of our community is really uh, suffering right now. Yeah. And uh, so we're not just talking facilities now and, and the services, but the, the overall general health of our people, the depressions, the uh, depressions, the oppression that has occurred, the freedoms that were, were taken f- away from us. Yeah. Um, and that's where it, the mental health, the services that yeah. continue to, you know, we need to continue to grow that, those services. Absolutely. It's, you know, because it's, it's no longer just, um, uh, you know, taking care of those with, uh, 
uh, drug issues and those uh, veterans with the also with the issues of PTSD and but now because of the pandemic mm-hmm. these other hidden issues that no one knows about you know are manifesting are manifesting Absolutely. and they're becoming more and more dominant in the community as as everything starts to open back up and everything starts to try to normalize again Absolutely. and and that's what we're seeing now is everything that happened in that that lockdown period is coming out absolutely you know and and um there's there the work is continuous it's never ending and uh something we definitely need to focus in on when we when we get into office senator is is we're, we're gonna have to take health care head on along with crime and all the many other issues that are out there. And, and that's why, and, and you said it uh, just a, a minute ago about the Central Public Health Center. Mm-hmm. You know, with that not being in operation and, you know, all those offices that were there now are spread out throughout the island. Yeah. You know, it's not at one location any longer. They, they need to get that building renovated and, you know, let's get let's get the, the Central Public Health back in there and, you know, continue to operate because... Uh, we, you know, we were talking about the the governor was talking about the, the the health campus that she wants to build up in Eagles Field. You know, first of all, she's taking away land from original landowners. Mm-hmm. Then she wants to build a billion dollar facility. Would the people of Guam be able to afford the debt service on that that billion dollar facility? It's certainly something I, I, that we that has to be considered. And you know so we we talked about crime we talked about safety we talked about healthcare mm-hmm. and of course cost of living um is, is certainly there infrastructure we just mentioned even even as it relates to to healthcare services homelessness we we touched on that and yeah. the poverty that is existing uh, education uh, recently they talked about facilities that have to be shut down schools and um i think it it it, it leads us into perhaps um some of the questions that we ought to take uh, that have come in um, during the week, and perhaps we can we can address it as we have a couple of minutes remaining. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I have one. Uh, do you have any advice for me when I grow up to be a governor one day? His name is Trevin Atoyki, and he's thirteen years old. Wow that that's a that's really wonderful to to hear that somebody would aspire to get into public service. And I I would have to tell Trevor that uh, sure. the public service. Is uh, is uh, definitely a sacrifice. I I would um, encourage you to to get as much education as you possibly can, and uh, but also get out there and work in the in the community, in the in the private sector, when, and understand what it what it what's what it's all about to to make a living, you know, understand the struggles of people, because uh, ultimately whether you you become a, a lawmaker in the legislature, um, whether you become a uh, somebody that's working in in um, in the judicial system, whether you're working as a public servant, um, it's all about public service, and you should aspire to become um, what's called a servant leader because you serve the people first and foremost. And so, aspire to be a servant leader, where you put others before yourself, and, and he, um, he perhaps could get involved in youth congress. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know he can start to know what the the, the process of yeah. uh, introducing bills and you know becoming a uh, a uh, a youth senator and then eventually moving up and becoming a governor one day. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, we got one from Alyssa Ash- Ashley. With the rising price of gas, will your administration work to improve public transportation? as well as implement other modes of transport, such as cycling or walking. I've realized Guam has become increasingly car dependent, following the example of North America, as road infrastructure has prioritized POVs and completely ignored other modes of transport. For example, the lack of dedicated bicycle lanes that are not shared with car lanes and the conundrum of disappearing sidewalks. Yeah. So, you know, with with that being the um the issue with the bike lanes and because the easements on the sides are only go so wide, mm-hmm. you know, the the roadway um and sidewalks now are are much wider than they used to be because of the power pole, you know, and I I think it goes way back in the day where, you know, they were putting power poles right in the middle of the sidewalk and so they built the sidewalk to go around the power pole and 
you know, if there's a way that they can actually, actually, there is a law that's supposed to, that anytime you're redoing a, a roadway, that you're supposed to integrate uh, sidewalks and bike lanes with it. So it's just a matter of the, the planning process of having bike lanes integrated there. I, I believe that we need to continue to work on mass transit. And that's what, uh, you know, I, I know there was an issue of uh, lack of buses, the, the, the turnaround time for uh, the transit buses to pick up and, and drop off. And those are going to be uh, issues that are going to hit us with a ton of bricks because um, mm -hmm. they're currently, uh, they're still, uh, they're still trying to plan for the plan with uh, Guam mass transit. And we, we need to get out of that. We need to, we really need to do something about the mass transit authority. Um, when you look at uh, what's been uh, happening lately, I think there are more companies now bringing in uh, electric um, electric uh, vehicles, and uh, now there are electric motorcycles and electric bicycles, right? So th this helps out with uh, you know less pollution, uh, more uh, uh, more friendly environment to uh, for for those that want to not yes. drive a car and just just ride a bike. Well, I, I certainly uh, recall the 2030 Federal Highway Master Plan that we had um, uh, gotten approved working with, uh, with the feds uh -huh. back, back in my administration. And uh, many of those major highways, of course, and roadways, secondary roads were, were um, improved. And the work continues. We, um, we do know that, that, um, that um, there are other... There are other jurisdictions. If we we take a look at what other island type of communities um, have implemented in trying, I I know that Hawaii has tried to implement a, a rail system mm -hmm. going into Honolulu. Um, but yes, it's only a matter of time. We're restricted by our our boundaries, yeah. and what can we do to improve it? So taking a look at at the master plan, uh, proper implementation. Um, many of secondary roads uh, that need to be paved and, and properly uh, addressed have been brought to our attention. Sidewalks that need to go, where yeah. more and more pedestrians would be there. Uh, certainly, um, driver education to be aware of those that are uh, riding their bicycles or even those on mopeds, because you see more and more people actively involved on either mountain biking or road bikes along right. for their health and exercise. But there needs to be a, there needs to be a concerted effort uh, throughout the community mm -hmm. to address this. Yeah. Ride sharing, there's so many different plans out there. But yes, uh, mass transit. We've uh, we've done that. Uh, many many also uh, helping those with disabilities to ensure that uh, they have proper modes of transportation from throughout the community would be necessary. Tourism has done a great job in it, uh, and that'll be revived again. All right. And we've had the trolley system going around, and even local residents have taken advantage of it. But it's only a matter of time before more and more cars get on the road, uh, privately owned vehicles, POVs. And congestion continues to to grow, and I recall the the days of two lanes, one 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 uh, lane in each direction, and now expanding. So it's all part of the growth, but we do have to um, find ways and methods of improving transportation and providing for those in need. And even on our and even on our platform, you know, we we talk about the you know uh, building of uh, infrastructures for electric mm -hmm. vehicles, you know. Uh, those type of things where, you know, we continue to be conscious of the environment and uh, hopefully that, you know, when when major roadways are reconstructed again, yeah. that, you know, uh, just like in the States, right, you got a dedicated bike path. There, there is a dedicated bike path on, yeah. on the main road. And, you know, I, it may come down to that one day and we'll see how that goes. But, you know, we, we're looking forward to addressing it, though. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or that time for? One I more? think I think that's uh, that should be it. Yes. Yeah, so, Senator, here we go, and I I, I just want to thank all those that um, have joined us today, and and perhaps you can um, wrap up the show there, Senator. Thank you. So, um, your vote matters. There's 51 days until the general election, and uh, you can register to vote by going online to. Uh, gec.guam.gov register or you can go visit the Guam Election Commission office at the Oka building in Timuning or by calling our headquarters at 671-475-2222 uh, early voting begins October 10th and ends on November 3rd 
You know, we also have the um, our uh, Friday night remix that are coming up, Octo- uh, September twenty third, October seventh, I believe, and October twenty one. Mm-hmm. And they can also register at the uh, at the Friday night remix uh, to vote. Uh, there'll be entertainment, there'll be uh, food trucks, and there'll be vendors there as well. So, you know, come on down and join us. It'll be at the Camacho Ada headquarters in uh, Tewining, right across Docomo Pacific, adjacent to uh, uh, Bank Pacific as well. Uh, you can ask questions through our social media. Engage with us on the trail by asking us questions through any of our social media platforms on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Your questions can be sent to us in text, audio, and video. And I'm still waiting for an audio or a video text, uh, audio or video uh, message to come in. Uh, We look forward to engaging with you in the digital space and answering your questions on the show. Join us for our upcoming events this week, which was the... uh, the uh, Friday night remix. So please, you know, don't forget about that. And we'll be uh, looking that that's September 23rd again, October 7th. It might be a Nana's birthday though, but uh, you, you got me covered. Right? Hey, yeah, yeah, you're covered. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. And November and October 21st. And um, we hope to, uh, you continue to join us on the trail. It's an exciting time for both of us and our Camacho at a team. And with that, that wraps up this show. So we look forward to uh, having you all join us next week on the trail with Felix and... Tony. Oh, thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs> Off a day. Off a day. Felix and Tony.